The angels were very powerful. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas divides the angels into choirs uh, from the angels and archangels, and you got the virtues <coughs> and powers and dominions, and then you have what are called the cherubim and the seraphim, and you have the different choirs of angels. Mm -hmm. That division was given by Thomas Aquinas, and uh, the highest angels would be like the cherubim and the seraphim, and there in heaven, simply praising God. The lower angels would be the ones that deal with us, angels and archangels. Now they had to, they had to pass a test because uh, for us to love God, we have to have freedom. Now, if we don't have freedom, we can't love God, otherwise we're robots, and a robot really can't love. So they had to pass a test. So exactly what that test was, theologians speculate. Thomas Aquinas says that possibly God the Father showed the angels a vision of the incarnate word. And that would be Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man. And the angels had to bow down and worship the incarnate word. So one of them, his name was Lucifer, said, Non serviam, I will not serve. And then you can read this in the book of Revelation. A battle ensued. Revelation chapter 12, there's a battle between the good spirit and the bad spirits. In other words, you had a battle between the angels. And one of the good angels, his name was Michael the Archangel. St. Michael the Archangel said, who is like unto God? So the battle ensued and Michael prevailed. And then the good angels prevailed over the bad angels. The bad angels, uh, they lost their places. And the bad angels were turned into devils. So devil is an angel. A devil is a fallen angel. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is present to you how God reacts to this rebellion of the angels so we recognize how God, how God interprets sin much differently than us. God sees sin differently. I'm going to give you about five different consequences of this sin. First of all, they lose their place in heaven. They had to pass this test so they could be confirmed in grace. They had to pass the test. Okay. Second would be that God created hell. Hell didn't always exist. So with the rebellion of the angels, uh, God created the fiery pit of hell. Third is that these angels were very beautiful, were transformed into ugly monsters. Okay, I can't use any more descriptive terminology better than that. And, and ugly monsters, they were just the, the epitome of ugliness. Aristotle defends beauty as proper proportion. That's the definition of Aristotle, okay? So you, uh, you, you imagine you, everything is disproportionate in hell, no? Out of whack. You know, your, your eyes up here on your forehead, that's, that's dispro disproportionate, okay? It's ugly, ugliness. And see, sin is ugliness. No? People were able to see it. The devil presents sin as glamorous, but really it's, it's ugly. And then oh, another effect is that uh, they are chastised in hell forever. It's not a temporary punishment, it's forever and ever and ever. To make things worse, uh, 
The devils are the epitome of hatred. They hate God. They hate themselves. They hate the other angels there, devils. They hate people. And, if I can say it, they hate us. They hate our guts. And they're going to do all they possibly can to tempt us, to drag us down into hell to be with them so that they can torture us for all eternity. <coughs> Ugly, isn't it? Yes. I know it's a strong talk, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's true. We don't want to admit this, but this, the whole, this is because of this one sin. See how one sin had this, this domino effect of uh, these repercussions that came from this one sin. So let's take the second sin. Second sin would be the sin of uh, of uh, our first parents called Adam and Eve. This you can find in Genesis chapter three in your Bible. Genesis chapter three. Like the angels, Adam and Eve had to pass a test. Also, Adam and Eve had to manifest that they loved God by a free act of their will, otherwise they'd be robots. I mean, God, God wants to be loved. And, you know, some of you have children. Uh, sooner or later, your children are going to have to make the decision that they come to church because they love God. And they're not being forced, okay? Uh, and you, you had to make that decision also. Is that, you know, go to church, okay, you're forced. It's good up to a certain point. You have to arrive at a certain point. You go to church because you love God, you love the Eucharist, and you want to get to heaven. Fear of the Lord is okay, but it's, we want to go beyond that. Okay? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's, we want to go beyond that. We want to, we want to love God. Well, the essence of, of sin, we don't want to sin because we love God. And he loves us. We don't want to do anything to our lover. Yep. Fulton Sheen defines sin as hurting the one you love. Very, very personal definition, right? Breaking the commandment, fine. That's very legalistic. It's okay. But hurting the one you love, I think, is a much more, more profound, intimate, personal definition of, of sin. So the whole psychology and dynamic of the sin of Adam and Eve, I think it's fascinating. And um, you know, now's the time because all of you know, all of you know Adam and Eve. You're, you've probably heard this story a hundred times, no? But we invite you to go go deeper into it. Most of you, I say, okay, Adam and Eve. Yeah, they ate the apple, and now Adam, Adam is, We have Adam apples as men, okay? <laughs> well, okay. I think we want to go beyond that, don't we? Okay. Uh, I think we can really have a very superficial interpretation of the Bible. That's why we want to, we want to go deeper, don't we? So Adam and Eve, they're created in the image and likeness of God, and they, they're placed in the garden, and God prohibited them there was one prohibition, not to eat the tree from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Honestly, it doesn't seem to be too big a deal, does it, to you? We got a lot of hoops. We got the Ten Commandments, right? They just said, you just don't eat that, just don't eat that fruit. It doesn't seem to be too much of a big deal. Maybe there are thousands of trees that were even better. Hmm? Maybe half a million. Maybe that was a pretty mediocre fruit anyway. No? But let's study the dynamic of that of the fall of our first parents. And the sin of Adam and Eve is our sin. Try to you say, oh, well, that happened, you know, a thousand years ago. It had nothing to do with me. It does. It has a lot to do with us, 
Because what happened with Adam and Eve, often we do the same thing. We've got freedom, and sometimes we abuse our freedom. Instead of using it, we abuse it. Okay, the first is this. So Eve, where, where do we find Eve in the garden? She's right next to that tree, right? Does that say anything? Wasn't she in the near occasion of sin? Have you ever done that? Hello? Yes. Probably every day, one way or another. No? How often we're, we're playing with fire, walking in thin ice, walking in a slippery slope. He who plays in danger will perish in danger, the Bible teaches us. Huh? How often we've committed sin because we're, we're, we're close to the near occasion. It's just a matter of a, of a gentle push and we collapse, we capitulate them. Huh? <coughs> Second is that the serpent the serpent, which obviously is symbolic of the devil, talks to Eve. Did you ever have a snake, stalk, uh, a serpent or a snake talk to you? Yeah, you did. Maybe not a rattlesnake or a, or a garter snake or a boa constrictor, probably not, no? But how often have you had thoughts? Have you ever had a, some bad thoughts? Yes. Hello? Yes. yes. Where do they come from? Yes. How often we've had bad thoughts and we allow them to go around in our mind and they go around again. It's kind of interesting. Hmm? Instead of deleting it, we press replay. <laughs> Not only that, but we embellish the movie, adding a little bit more color and glamour to it, huh? But that's the work of the devil. The God allows the devil to work on your imagination. God allows it. Be aware of that. Okay, there you are. There, there in your mind you have this, this bad image before your, your mind. It happens to all of us. God allows the devil to present that to you. So once it happens, then you have to decide what to do with it. It's up to you. You have to decide then what to do with it. It's a bad thought, right? Are bad thoughts sins? What do you think? you think so? Well, it's a good question. There's once a priest that asked a man, did you entertain bad thoughts? He said, no, they entertain me. <laughs> so bad thoughts are, are not sins unless we, we purposely entertain them. What if we act on it, that becomes a sin? Even worse. Even worse. Yep. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, what, it, 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 as soon as you have a bad thought, you give, you'll, give, you'll give consent in your will, you already have a sin. But then you act on it, then you, it, it's worse. For example, you have a thought, okay, you're in a, a store, I'm going to rip off that bike. Doors open, okay, there's no policeman there. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bike that you always want because you want to go on the Tour de France in the year 2020, okay? And you're, you're preparing and you're getting in shape, huh? But you have enough money to buy that bike. So you made that decision. Right when you're about to get on it and go out the back door, this six foot, six, foot six man, 300 pounds, a policeman with a police dog and a gun and one of those sticks walks by you. You say, oh, hello, police officer. Thank you for all the work you do to defend safety. 
you committed the sin, but the fact you didn't carry it out, the sin is less. But you already had the decision in your heart that you were going to do it. So there's the, in, the inner decision in the will, then there's the execution, which, which compounds it. If I can speak like a moral theologian. As you can tell, I love moral theology. Well, that's why I'm a confessor, right? Very, very, very important in the formation of, of our conscience. That's 50% of my work is that. I spend a lot of time, many, many, many hours in the confessional helping people to form their conscience. For example, someone comes to me. Uh, do you, you, do you, uh, Holy Week? Do you, do you go to Mass on Good Friday? Yes. How about you? Sometimes? Okay, the, the three of them go to Mass on Good Friday, but there's no Mass on Good Friday, okay? Okay, Okay. They, they, they go to Mass, but there's no Mass, okay? The three of them go to Mass on Good Friday. Okay, okay. well, okay. Now what would happen if someone didn't go to Mass on Good Friday and came to me as confessor, I'm confessor, Father, I miss Mass on Good Friday. What would you do as a confessor? Okay, you committed most likely a mortal sin, but by the way, there's no Mass on Good Friday. <laughs> you went against your conscience. We have the seven you went against your conscience. So what do I do? I respect your erroneous conscience that you acted in bad faith by not going. Then I come in as a teacher to enlighten the conscience. There's a beautiful ceremony. Now, it's really good to go to the ceremony of Good Friday. Okay, you didn't have to go. You had to fast, though, because you're older than 16, right? You're not 59 yet, are you? Okay. Did you fast? No, I didn't. Okay, well, next year, recognize that you have to fast on Good Friday. You get it. You're going to go to bed with your, with your stomach growling and say, Okay? Or pancita. I don't know. Right? See, what I'm saying is, we have so much ignorance. I mean, I didn't say that to, to, to embarrass both of you. I knew you were going to. I knew I knew you were going to respond in that way to, to kind of illustrate a point. But the fact that you 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 thought there was a mass, you didn't go. You know, that 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 would probably be a mortal sin because you went against your conscience on what you thought was a moral imperative that you had to go to mass on that day. You're going to see in, in, in nine weeks, when you end this course, your conscience is going to be totally different. I promise you. If you can, if you can hang in here, you, you, you're going to be, you, you, your life, gonna, your, your perspective of what's right and wrong is going to be totally different. And what you did maybe five weeks ago, you're not going to do it because your conscience is going to be much more refined. The closer you get, can get to light, the more you can see the splotches on your white dress. You're wearing a black dress, and at midnight you can't see that coffee mark, but where you're exposed, a little bit of coffee mark on that white, white dress head, you better, better wash it before you go to the party. So the closer we get to the light, the more we're able to see. You know, we have to form our conscience in the light of the, of the gospel truth and the magisterium and the teaching of the church. God bless you. So let's get back to Eve. So there she is, uh, and the devil, the, the serpent talks to her. She should not have entered into dialogue with that snake, with that serpent. And that's what we do. We have we play mind games, mind games. And we open up our, our mind to, to mind games. And then the, the the serpent says, "Why didn't you eat from?" from that fruit and she says no because if we eat we will die that was God said what does the serpent say no 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 you'll become like unto gods so there we have Jesus says the devil is a liar from the beginning John chapter 8 there we have the devil lying and placing doubts in God's goodness 
You ever doubt? Have you any doubts in your life? Often doubts they come from the devil. I think we all assaulted by doubts. Stop and ask. Where did they come from? Did they come from the Holy Spirit? No. Fat chance. I don't think so. Uh-uh. Yeah, it's the enemy working on you. He's trying to take away your peace. He's trying to pull you away from the Catholic faith. I've been giving many talks in, on uh, Marian consecration in the past six months. And one thing I say is one thing the devil does, he tries to push us away from Mary. If you're being pushed away from Mary, that's a sure sign of the demonic. You got Catholics that give up their, they become born again Christians or Jehovah Witnesses. Not only do they reject Mary, but they end up by hating Mary. It's true. Right, I'm, I'm keenly aware of it, and I, I see the work of the devil. You got a Catholic becomes a born again Christian, and they're attacking Mary ruthlessly. Let me ask you this. When you die, what's going to happen? You're going to be judged. Who are you going before? Jesus Christ. What would happen if you sit down before Jesus Christ to be judged, hating his mother? I don't think you'll get very far. It's scary, isn't it? And there, there are a lot, even Catholics, that, that reject Mary. The knowledge I give is, I can invite the three of you to meet my family, my, my nine siblings, my 39 nephews and nieces, and my mom. The big family, huh? And during the course, you're kind of shooting the breeze with one of my nieces that are your age, and then talking with my, the brother of the doctor because you've got back problems, and maybe get a free service from the guy from Orlando, no? And you're really having a good time, but the three of you, you have snubbed and even even insulted my mother. You become an enemy to the Broom family because you insulted my mother. That's what St. Louis de Montfort says, he who does not have Mary as mother does not have God as father. Strong, isn't it? This is St. Louis de Montfort. He who does not have Mary's mother does not have God his father, nor Jesus his older brother. Sorry, if I'm going up in a tangent. It's just I, I love Mary, and I do all I can to defend Mary, because if you love Mary, Mary's going to Mary's going to help us to get to heaven. Exactly. Yeah, no matter what we've done, if we got this love for Mary, <laughs> she's going to help us at least get into the back door, right? Maybe in through the roof, huh? <laughs> right? But rejecting Mary... Rejecting Mary, that's a sign of the diabolic. It is. Fulton Sheen says that when he goes and when he's going to die, goes before Jesus, he's going to say, he's going to say, I know someone who's spoken very good about you, and that is my mother. Welcome home. I hope Jesus says that about me. And about you too. And you too. Really, I believe it. If we're really promoting love for the Blessed Mother, hey man, <laughs> we got one. We got one foot in heaven. Loving Mary, talking to her, consulting her, trying to imitate her, promoting her devotion, and we're we're close to heaven. She's the Queen of Heaven, right? I wrote to her daily. Do you think I'll do that? Beautiful. My second book that I wrote is on that. Mary and the Rosary, no? Maybe one day you'll, you'll buy my second book. Mm -hmm. Right now what we're doing is we, tomorrow we have another group, it's called Mary and Consecration Group. <coughs> Yesterday we had one in Spanish with about 450 people. Spanish always beat out the English speaking, no? <laughs> church, you could barely get people in the church, no? They're coming from all over the place, they love Mary, no? Mexican, I mean, our Lady Guadalupe, in a way. <laughs> okay, so Eve, uh, she, she listens to the serpent. And then 
She doubts God, and then she looks up with her eyes. What are the eyes? Are the mirror to the soul. Goes in the eyes. Goes up here, right? And down here. Transferred into an action. We repeat the same action, becomes a habit, right? Good habit, virtue, bad habit, vice, huh? And that forms our personality, who we are. And then our destiny, either up or, up or down. No? So she bites into it and she eats. And that started what I call a moral tsunami that has repercussions until the end of the universe. Know what a tsunami is? You ever hear the word tsunami? It was a moral tsunami that has repercussions until the end of the universe. Because what Adam and Eve did has an influence on who we are and what we do and the way we act. Because we're all born now with original sin because of the sin of Adam and Eve. I know as a kid I used to say, why do I have to be born with it? They ate, they ate the apple. It doesn't seem to be fair. You all, you all probably thought about that when you were a kid, right? And I think it's a good question. I mean, why do I have to have a original sin? They ate it, I. But um, we're born with it. And original sin is washed away by baptism, but the effects of original sin, we've got those. Protestant Luther basically says we are, we are, we are a, a mass of corruption. Doesn't sound very good, does it? No. Okay. We believe, as Catholics, that the human person is basically good, but we have these strong inclinations toward evil. If we don't hold back these proclivities, then what happens? They get the best of us, and we can become pretty, pretty wicked people. So either we conquer sin through God's grace, or we become slaves to sins. Sin is slavery. Ever see Boraccio? He's, he's a slave. He's a, he's a slave to the drink. Huh? It's Miller time. He becomes a slave. Can't control himself anymore. So, look at all these. Look at all these effects of original sin. What was the what was the what was the uh, chastisement that God? imposed upon the woman. Pain. Yeah. yeah, bringing forth children in pain. Any of you mothers? Was that just a figment of your imagination or is it really true? Is it just a joke or? Very true. How many times? Three times. Three Okay, well, I mean, three, four times, you know when it happens. <laughs> no joke, huh? Maybe one day you'll learn. <laughs> my, my, my little sister, who has eight, the last one, she went into labor and she couldn't do She's too weak. She had to go back and, because you know, the baby wouldn't come out. You know, my little sister's not, she's not big. She really tried, but there was a lot of pain, and you know, you got to get that baby out. <laughs> That's as a result of original sin. Women will bring forth children in pain. What about men? Remember what it is? Earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. So you've got to work hard and you, you sweat to try to make ends meet, right? I heard a story of this man that was in a factory and uh, his boss said, come here, go get your jacket, Get your hat, you're fired. He said, why? I didn't do anything, that's why you're fired. <laughs> Got that? So earning bread by the sweat of your brow. Then there's a certain darkening of the intellect. Awakening of the will certain emotional disorder, sicknesses. 
We all get sick at times. And there's been a Gallup poll study that came out about a year ago. Gallup poll says this. I don't know if you agree with this. Sometimes Gallup, Gallup polls are pretty accurate. Said 100% of the people living today one day will die. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Yes. Nobody can avoid it, right? That's the end of the world for us. So that's uh, because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Look, look what happened. One more sin. The sin of there's there's this one man. Ignatius presents this one man, or could be a woman, who commits one mortal sin, and God says, "Well, that's enough. He dies, and he goes to hell right away." It's just one mortal sin. God said, "Well, you, I I want to just give you one chance." Boom, dies. Hell. I know what you're thinking. That's not fair. Well, wait a minute. Is God obliged to give us many, many chances? No. This, this sin, it's a, it's, a, it's a small, it seems to be very humble, but I believe it's a spiritual, psychological masterpiece. I'll explain why. Maybe it's happened in your life. Maybe you find, your, find yourself in mortal sin. And then, okay, you're on the freeway. Any of you know how to drive? You're driving the freeway. All of a sudden, this Big Mac truck pulls in front of you, and you're kind of sandwiched in between another truck. And it seems as if, I mean, you're, you're going to become an accordion. I mean, you're dead. Something happens that they kind of separate, and nothing happens. It was just a matter of a split second and you would have been killed. Instantaneously. Ever happened in your life? You were on the freeway, you almost got an accident, and it could have been fatal. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me ask one more question. Respond interiorly. Were you in the state of grace when that happened? Okay, you would have died instantaneously. Where would you be now? What? Where? You'd be in hell. Is it God's fault or your fault? So what, what a beautiful little meditation this is. <laughs> this is of all the 70 meditations, this is one of my favorites. Because if you think about this seriously, think about this. You would, be hell, you would be in hell now, and it's your fault. God is so good that he's given you another chance. Because you're alive now. How good God is. We would be in hell, burning for all eternity. In our fault. Maybe, maybe you know, you're, you're driving, you miss mass, you got drunk, you premarital sex, you looked at pornography, anything, no? It's easy to commit a mortal sin. Very easy. And you know it. God's beckoning you to go to confession. You're always putting it off. No? I love this meditation. It's strong. When I give this, there's people are always shocked when they hear this. And this is not Father Broom. This is St. Ignatius now. Sometimes God has to send us earthquakes. It kind of shake us a little bit. Shock value. To wake us up, to shake us out of our lethargy, you know, our, lethar our lethargical state of life. You can be lethargic, huh? <laughs> yeah. What is the fruit of this? Gratitude, humility, and conversion. If you do it well, gratitude, thanks. Thank you, God, that you gave me another chance. Thank you. Humility, I could have been lost. 
could have been lost. Conversion starting right now, I'm going to get out of sin. I'm not going to wait until tomorrow. Understand? I mean, I, I, I love these exercises. I've been giving these exercises for 13 years, and I never get tired of giving the exercises because they're so, they're so powerful. If they're done well, in my experience, the exercise is what changes people's lives, if you do them well. If you do these exercises well, your life will be changed. If you're, you're not going to put in the effort, nothing's going to happen. You've got to do your part. In other words, you've got you, you know, to you work at these exercises. They're exercises, huh? Hey, you do exercises? And you ever do any exercises? Yes. You, know, you do the curls, or maybe the military rest, or the bench press. You do it the first time. Hey, you're aching. You're rigor mortis the following morning, huh? <laughs> so once you start to do them, it becomes second nature, you know? Muscle tone, you maybe two different ways of you lifting weights, huh? You start to build up power. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So th th that's the triple sin. Now, let's move from that. Uh, let me just go through the rules quickly, then we'll break up into our groups. Remember last week we talked about St. Ignatius when he was being converted. He had the dynamic of the two spirits, remember? He was thinking about becoming famous and winning the hand of the queen and she he felt a lot of uh, pleasure in the surface of his soul and then he was cast into desolation then he thought about the lives of the saints if Francis can do it I can do it if Dominic can do it I can do it if Augustine can do it I can do it if the desert fathers can do it so can I so one one series of thoughts brought him to desolation the other brought him to consolation that's what we're going to talk about in the next five minutes before we end our talk today. Is that constantly within you, you have the dynamic of these various mo movements. And you have to discern. You're in constant state of battle and discernment. So the good spirit, you open up your heart and receive it. The bad spirit, you're called to reject. That happen, that's happening constantly in our life. Constantly in our life. And the fact that you're not aware of it because you've never been trained, but our life is a constant spiritual battle. In other words, you've got to, there's the good vibes and the bad vibes. Buenas ondas, malas ondas, he is a prefieres español. Buenas ondas, malas ondas. No? The good vibes... That's the inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Accept it. The bad vibes, that's a temptation from the devil. Reject it. Yeah. Battleground. So for the first rule. Okay, the, the first rule is what? Okay, when you're in mortal sin. Mortal sin, what? Does the bad spirit do, and what does the good spirit do? When you're in bad, when you're in mortal sin, the, the the bad spirit, through false reasoning and playing with your emotions, tries to push you to commit more and more and more and more and more to increase these mortal sins, so that you what it becomes a habit. Then you become addicted. You ever hear of an addiction? Yes. Then you become a slave. And then worse yet is that it takes away your conscience where you don't even feel bad about doing what you're doing. What you're doing. That's a major triumph of the devil. So sin, more sin, more serious sin. You fall into it. You become a slave to it. You've got an addiction. And then you justify it and say, well, everyone else is doing this is This is modern life. So many people live in this state today. Probably most. No? So the devil can, can lure you into a false sense of happiness. Where you actually feel good with yourself, even though you're living far away from God in mortal sin. So what about the good spirit? The good spirit actually takes away your peace. Your false sense of peace. I'll give you an example. For many, many years, 
uh, I've given the <laughs> baptismal talk. Now Teresa gives it because she's giving it on Wednesday when I'm giving this talk. And um, see how I use this rule. You got 100 people, 200 people there in the old church building. They're there to have their baby baptized. And uh, most of them, they're just living with their boyfriend. Okay? Most. Sometimes many, 70%. And uh, I come in, and I'm, I'm pretty crafty, pretty astute. No? So I come in, and I greet them. I say a prayer. And then, and then I tell a joke. Yeah, this priest's pretty good. Then they tell another joke. Then they tell a really funny joke. Ah, ha, 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 This priest, he's cool. He's macanoodle. Hey, he's, he's really with it, huh? Still, I, I got him. Huh? I'm buttering them up, okay? <laughs> so I got him in the palm of my hand, but a few jokes, huh? And I'm going to go after him, huh? I'm going to come down with a knife now, okay? He said, I, I noticed these baptismal forms that most of you people, most of you people, you're not married in the church. You know, that's pretty bad. Oh. <laughs> you know, also, you know, you've got these children you're baptized. You're giving a terrible example to these little children. Next is, you know, you, you can't go to confession. You're living in mortal sin. You can't receive Holy Communion. And if you die without repentance, you could all go to hell. He's not as good as we thought. <laughs> when they came in, they were perfectly at peace with their conscience. When they leave, they're no Lord at peace. They're cussing me out in the car. <laughs> cussing me out in the car. But I have accomplished exactly what I intended to do. To put a thorn in their conscience, they're no longer at peace with themselves. Then a month later, two weeks later, they call Teresa and say, you know, that priest, Father Escobita, that guy's a tough guy, you know? He's a toughie. But you know, we thought about this. We know he was tough, but we recognize that he was right. When can we come in to start our process to get married in the church? Six months later, they're married in the church. <laughs> they use these rules to save souls. Because people can manipulate emotions for the bad. I, I do it to save souls. Why not? That's what you're here for. Yeah, Jesus says you have to be as simple as dove but as crafty as serpents. I try to be that, yeah. yeah. These, these rules are great. They're masterpieces. Okay, then the second rule, second rule is a person's in grace and is really trying to become a saint, intensely purifying himself of, of, of sin. Now, what the good spirit and bad spirit is going to do in the second world, the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So you're in the state of grace, and the devil is going to be tormenting you by trying to take away your peace by lies and by scrupulosity. You didn't really make a good confession. You didn't tell the sins. You weren't really sorry. You know, that uh, doing your holy hour, you know, that's such a long thing. That priest is kind of a fanatic. No, take it easy. You know, it's too much. So that's the working of the bad spirit. Whereas a good spirit is kind of like a cheerleader, encourage keep up the good work. You made the holy hour. God is happy with you. God loves you. You're on the highway to heaven. The erosion was good. You know, this is going to be the best experience in your life. That's the good spirit. You probably experienced it that last week, some of you. Amen? Amen. That's, the, that's the second rule. It's really important to understand these rules because... We, we, all, we all go through this, but we don't know, 
we don't know what to do when we're going through, the, through these states. So the third and fourth rule, third and fourth rule are probably the easiest rules to understand. Okay, the, the, the third and fourth rule are descriptive rules. You know, one, one way of writing, if you're a writer, is narrative, description, poetry, prose. Description is a type of writing. So you describe, what, what do you give? Characteristics that explain what is, what is in the state of consolation. Consolation is when you feel the growth of faith and hope and love and peace and joy. You really feel drawn to God. You feel happy inside. You really feel like when to become a saint. It's kind of like a beautiful spring day where the breeze is coming down upon you. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. You can smell the, the fragrance or the redolence of the flowers in the spring, in the spring air. If I can speak like a poet. Interiorly. That's consolation. We've all experienced it. Desolation is the opposite. Like being, it's like being in a tunnel. Dark tunnel. And you ever been in the, the Pennsylvania Turnpike? You got the long, one of the longest tunnel, I think, in the country. And you're going that tunnel. Are you ever going to get out of it, right? So, uh, if you've read the Pennsylvania, you ever been at Pennsylvania Turnpike? I mean, it goes on and on and on. Feel when well, you're never going to get out. You've got enough light on the very top of it, but it's pretty dark. No? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, desolation, lack of faith, lack of hope, lack of love. You feel sad, you feel depressed, you feel discouraged. Athlete, you want to throw the towel, and you throw in the towel, you want to give up. Life is a drag. What's the purpose of this? We all go through that. We all go through that. Sometimes in one day, there's a, there's a fluctuation between both in one day. Something, hours, we, we fluctuate. We're not the same person. But you have to, you got to name it, claim it, and tame it, okay? That? Yeah. A nice little acronym, huh? Name it, claim it, and tame it. And I put together another, another acronym in this. It's the B-U-T. And that's rule five and six. Remember the BUT, five and six. I'll explain what the BUT is after I explain five and six. Rule five is this. It's what most people remember 10 years later. Right, Kristen? And rule five is this. When you're in the state of desolation, make no changes. Okay, when you're really in desolation, you feel kind of sad, depressed. What the devil tries to do is get you to pray less. Okay, well, don't do your holy hour. You don't really feel like it. The younger people say, you know, you have to be true to yourself. You don't feel like it. You just don't do it. You just sleep in. No? Get, you know, get, get your beauty sleep, and you don't want to look like a, 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 a bruca. No? <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> and behind that is the devil, huh? The devil, the devil is behind that, yeah. So Ignatius says, when you're in the state of desolation, make no changes in your spiritual life, otherwise you are in real danger. You know, you make your holy hour at 6 o'clock, ah, make it at 6 o'clock in the evening. Just sleep in, you know, kind of getting old, no? Kind of getting gray hair, you know, you sleep in. Ah. <laughs> you know, you pray two rows right now, just pray the chap of divine mercy, that's enough. You went to daily mass? No. Why are you going to daily mass? Just go on Sunday. You don't have to go to mass every day. You are a fanatic. Come on. <laughs> you know, you're doing spiritual reading. Nah, no, go back and look at those telenovelas. You gotta kinda of be with it, no? You gotta get a pulse on the society and what's going on. Huh? <coughs> See, all this is the devil. And we're in the desolation. If we're not attentive, we can fall into this trap. He plays with our emotions, remember? The mind game he plays with us? The mind game. So play, uh, this is the rule everyone remembers. You know, when you're in the state of desolation, make no changes in your spiritual practices. Got that? Uh, but, but we do. 
Sometimes the devil gets the best of us. Okay, and then the sixth rule is it's called the, uh, in, in, in Latin, the agere contra. Agere contra means you've got to go against the desolation, fight against it. Say so we're spiritual soldiers, agere contra means to react intensely against the desolation. So you're tempted to sleep in a little bit more, get up five minutes earlier. You're tempted to uh, go out and eat a little bit more, yeah, a little bit of fasting. You're tempted to cut your holy hour into 50 minutes, 63 minutes. You're tempted to be a chismosa in a cayete. <laughs> You're tempted to maybe not say the rosary, pray two rosaries. It's hard. This is spiritual combat. This is what the saints do. You read through the lives of the saints. All the saints do it. And you, you admire them, don't you, Krista? I mean, you admire the saints. I'll give you an example. Um, <coughs> Mary, I think you read the life of Anthony Mary Claret. Yes. St. Anthony Mary Claret, who found the Claritians, <coughs> um, when he was about five years old, no, no, maybe about seven, six or seven. Uh, he always had a really good rapport with his mother, but the devil tempted him to hate his mother when he was about seven. Just a real violent hatred against his mother. It was really strong. He was just a, an innocent little kid, and the devil, all these ugly thoughts to hate his mother. So he goes to confession, and he tells the priest, and then the priest says, well, what did you do when you had those thoughts? He said, every time I get those thoughts, I try to be especially loving and even more gentle with my mother. Wow. Seven years old. I don't think I've ever met a seven-year-old in my life that's ever done that yet. In 33 years as a priest, but this guy's a saint. I remember reading this years ago. I almost fell off my chair. I thought, this, what, a, what a beautiful example in the lives of saints. And Chris said that was the Agé de Contra, doing the exact opposite. Right, Dana? Say, si, Padre. Yeah. The exact opposite. You see, the devil tempts us to, to, to move towards sin, to sensuality, whereas the good spirit, now you've got to pray, you've got to practice more penance. Mm -hmm. It's hard. But the saints do it. We're all called to become saints, right? Now, in that Ajade country, he gives you four things. Okay, four things he suggests that you do. Prayer, you've got to pray more. Meditation, you've got to be faithful to your holy hour. Then he says a little bit of penance. Some devils are cast out only by prayer and fasting, right? No. Some devils are cast out only by prayer and fasting. Give up that chocolate chip cookie that you really like, you know? Eat a soggy cracker. <laughs> Instead of that Coca-Cola, a little bit of warm water with a little bit of lemon in it, okay? <laughs> That's hard. Because often they will pull, push us to, to buy, to eat, to give into our sensuality, you know? So, the, the lives of the saints, this, if you take it seriously, you're on the highway to heaven, but it's hard. It's hard work. And the last, he says, is examine your conscience because you're in desolation, maybe because you're eating too much. Maybe you're sleeping too much. Maybe you're in a chismosa, right? Maybe you're giving into that. Maybe you're looking at things on TV with, with bad scenes, you know? Well, it's, it's modern America, but... Well, see, you shouldn't be watching that. You know better than that. So you're in, in desolation because you're looking at something that's tarnishing your, your mind. He said, blessed are the pure of heart that will see God, right? So that's rule six. My acronym, B-U-T. I put this acronym together, which is pretty helpful. The acronym is how we can apply the rules. We've gone through six rules 
we got another eight rules to go. We're going through it piecemeal. BUT stands for, are you listening? Yes. Be aware. Be aware. Understand. Take action. Yeah, got it. <laughs> like that? <laughs> Good one. No? That's, that's how to put these rules into practice, that little acronym. Be aware. Be aware. Understand. This is coming from the bad spirit. Take action. Reject. Apply the rules. These are great, aren't they? So uh, you're going to have a great week. Be generous with God. Walk with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Be, be open because God is going to sho shower you with so many graces. So I'll pray for you that these will be the best weeks in your life, okay? Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you and the Saint Ignatius. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you and have a great one.